So, hello to you, don't know me. I'm Jeff. I'm called Alex Abbott, leading here at Mosaic. And it's good to see all of you here gathered this morning and those of you joining us online. So, um, I wonder if reading that story that Mike read for us earlier, did anyone feel a little bit hungry? Just, just a little bit hungry, huh? And um, maybe the fact that we're all going to eat later and then feel yes. nice, nice amount of stuff or something to do with it. Well, um, maybe this will make you feel a bit more hungry, or not, I don't know. Could, could be more appetizing, I don't know. But what will we call this here? I'm interested to hear. Unhealthy food. Unhealthy food, right, thank you, Alex. Right. Anyone else? For maybe a slightly more specific. Uh, what would you say, Dad? How will we describe this here? Anybody? So, 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 yeah, well, I mean, we might call it a fish bun or a fish sandwich, okay? Um, us Brits tend to call a sandwich something that's two slices of bread rather than a roll, which we call that maybe a fish roll, okay? Those distinctions are very important, aren't they? Um, now, here, we have been, the, the story we're going to look at today is essentially about this. It's about a fish sandwich, okay? Because what's it that they fed? They fed bread. And they're fed fish. Now, um, back in the day there, and certainly in that part of the world, they would probably have had what we call more like a flatbread, more of a kind of pitta or a um, wrap, that kind of bread. And it would probably had a dried fish, probably a, as Alex wisely observed, a kind of battered, fatty type fish here. So, this is a story about fish sandwiches. But a sandwich, I want you to think of a sandwich, okay? What are the key things that make a sandwich? Two bits of bread and something to put in the middle. Right, that's what you have to make a sandwich. You have two things that are the same outside and something in the middle. Now, Mark, whose gospel we've been going through, likes his sandwiches. Now, I bet you didn't know that, did you? Yeah. He was someone who liked his sandwiches. Now, I'm not saying by that that when he was writing, um, he would uh, you know, disappear off, make up his you know, famous words, peanut butter and jam, jelly, uh, things like that. Uh, no, he would, um, it was the way that he would write, is he wrote things so as to make a sandwich. Now, if you were here two weeks ago, um, our friend and brother Steve Mensah came to preach to us about the fact that Jesus was rejected by his friends, but also that Jesus sent off his disciples to do a mission. And if, if you were to look back to verse 12, if you've got the Bible open in front of you, Mark 6, you'll see that he said that the disciples went out telling everyone they met to repent of their sins and to turn to God. The disciples being sent out on a mission. Now, last week I was not here, so I'm relying on your feedback here. Did you or did you not look at chapter 6, verses 14 to 29, which I call Herod's Party? Is that what you all heard of him? Birthday party. Birthday party? <laughs> right, it was a birthday party. Right, okay. Wow. Okay, yes, so a rather interesting substitute for a cake, I think, in that story, wasn't it? Okay. Yes. So. What did we read, though, in the beginning of this story, in verse 30? The apostles, same people to the disciples, returned to Jesus from their ministry tour. Now, that would make no sense unless you look back to the ark, they have gone out to do something, and now they've returned. What Mark has done is he's kind of begun the story, and then he says, right, oh, let's, let's just pause that. Here's another story, almost a completely different one, it seems about Herod, and then he comes back to the disciples. Now, this is a good example of what Mark does where he makes a sandwich. Begins one story, tells you another one, and then brings you back. Now, why? Why does he kind of write about that? Well, it would seem to be that what he's trying to get you to do is to say, hmm, what's the thing in the middle got to do with the things at the end? And as we're going to look at this passage today, what I want us to do is to be trying to eat the whole sandwich in a way. What we'll be doing is we'll keep looking back 
at the previous passages we've looked at to see how that helps us to understand the passage we're looking at now. So we're still continuing going through Mark. And really, I think the question for us today is a bit like the ones you might have if you ate a sandwich. You might say, that was nice, but I don't really feel full up. Okay, it may be fine, but it's unlikely to be your main meal of the day. And therefore, the question is, how can you be satisfied? Because really, what this story here is presenting us with is, what is it that we're looking at in life to be satisfied? And that takes us back to Mark's big questions that we keep coming back to when we're going through Mark's Gospel, where we've been seeing, asking the question, who is Jesus? Why did he come? What does it mean to follow him? And once again, we're going to get some more answers as we go through this passage today. But before we do that, let's come to God in prayer and ask for his help. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the blessing that it is to be gathered together. Father, we thank you for our church in Mosaic. And here, today we're marking five years of uh, starting this ministry here in this area, of seeking to reach people, of seeking to establish a church. And we give you thanks, Father, we're able to gather in this way. And we thank you, Father, it's always and only through the power of your word that you bring change in our lives and in the lives of others. And we pray today that as we have always asked, as we've sought week after week, over five years, that the power is in your word to change us and to change each of us who may be listening, Father. Help us then, we pray, in this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So, the big idea that we're going to see, I hope, from this passage is that Jesus is the compassionate shepherd who provides a feast for his people. Jesus is the compassionate shepherd. And I hope that we'll see that the aim of this passage, really, is to encourage us to help us move towards trusting Jesus as your King and your God to satisfy your deepest needs. So hopefully we've all got an outline on the um, handout, uh, those of you who are here at least to see this as we go along. And the first thing we're going to see is that Jesus is the teacher with compassion. Jesus is the teacher with compassion. Let's go back and look at that passage that Mike read for us. So we read that the apostles returned to Jesus from their ministry tour, as we were just thinking. And they told him all they had done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. Let's think about it. The disciples have been going off. They've been uh, telling people uh, uh, the good news of Jesus. They've been healing people. Right? They've done an awful lot of things. And they probably came back. It sounds like they're excited, especially from things we read in the other Gospels. But they're probably pretty tired out as well. And what about Jesus? Well, let's think what has happened before Okay, we had this uh, rather strange you know, story of this birthday party and this rather horrible thing that happened. And who was it who died in the previous passage? Who was it? John. John the Baptist. Okay, and remember, John the Baptist was a relative of Jesus. Okay, probably a second cousin or something like that. So you can imagine Jesus himself is probably feeling quite sad. And um, he sees that what they all need to do at the moment, we just need to go off and be by ourselves. And that's just worth remembering what he says there. That's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. We've misunderstood Jesus if we think the Christian life is all about working and working and working and working non-stop. There's always something else I need to be doing for him. Now, Yes, there is plenty to do, and we, we should completely throw ourselves in. But there's also times when we need to say, no, I need to take the time away, and I need to have a rest. Jesus, like us, is a human. Even now, Jesus is sat at God's right hand as a human. He knows what it is to have a human body, what it is to be tired, what it is to suffer grief. After all, didn't we read uh, some months ago about um, how he fell asleep in a boat, in a storm. That kind of shows what it is that Jesus knew what it was to be tired. 
and to rest. And so the things were so busy, as Jesus, as we read here, that they didn't even have time to eat. So they leave on a boat and go to a quiet place. Except many people recognized them and saw them leaving, and people from many towns ran ahead along the shore and got there ahead of them. And Jesus saw the huge crowds and stepped out of the boat. Now, if I wanted to go to a place where it was quiet, and I have a boat, and I'm reaching a place, and I see there's loads of people there. I don't know about you, but I would think, tell you what, why don't we just row on a bit further, okay? Why don't we just look for somewhere that is a bit quieter to go? But Jesus sticks with this place they've ended up to go. And why is that? We read, he had compassion on them, because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus sees this crowd that has gathered, and the thing he sees about them, he says they're like sheep without a shepherd. Now, a shepherd is not just someone who looks after sheep, it's actually also a figure, a way of representing someone who is a leader in those days. Now, Leaders. What leader have we read about in the previous passage? What was his name? Herod. Did Herod come across as being a good leader or a bad leader from what you've read remember about him? I think you'd say he's bad, yeah? So these are people and they're living in a place. And what's their leader like? He's, he's a pretty rotten man, okay? But not only that. They're described as being like sheep without a shepherd. What's the thing of a sheep without a shepherd? They just go off on their own, follow one another, end up in all sorts of difficult situations. In other words, they are lost. These are people who are seeing that they are lost. And without someone to rule over us, without someone we can look up to and say, yes, this person I can trust, this person can give me hope. We all end up being lost. And the fact that maybe we kind of think, well, I can just do my own thing, is itself showing that maybe we're more lost than we realise. We may be running after our jobs, our careers, our education, money, relationships, and making those things to go, the thing to go after. But if so, we are showing we are lost. Now, when Jesus saw them, did he say, <laughs> come on guys, let's, let's, uh, let's quickly start rowing again, let's, let's get away, okay? I don't want to get mixed up with all these troubles, we're trying to escape them. No, what keeps them there, stepping out of the boat, is that Jesus had compassion on them. And notice, Jesus has compassion on people who are lost. He's not saying that these people said, oh, so these are really good people, these could be, these could be better followers than you 12 here. I mean, come on, you, you guys are tough. I've got to find some better material amongst this group. So they're really promising. And look at all the sacrifices they've made to come and find me. Hey, let's get this group. No, he sees them as lost. He sees them as people who are needy, people who have problems. And when it says that he had compassion on them, the word it uses is to say that there was something deep inside Jesus that went out to them. It literally says he felt it deep in his belly. We would say in his, in his heart that he felt deeply in his heart for them. And the interesting thing is that the Bible never uses this word for anybody else, only Jesus. It only uses this to describe Jesus. He feels kindness, he feels concern, he feels affection, he feels for all these people. He sees them for who they are, and it moves him. It moves him deeply for them. And the important thing about this is that too often our way of thinking of God, or thinking of Jesus, is that he looks down on pain, he looks on people being lost and bad things going on, and he doesn't care. Too often we think 
It doesn't seem to matter to God how I am. It doesn't seem to make any difference. But here we read that Jesus looked on people who were lost and he had compassion for them. I'm just reading you a book which I found by far the most helpful one I've read in five years, Gentle and Lowly by Dana Ortlund. And it's just a short piece I wanted to read to you where he describes Jesus in the Gospels and says, time and again, it is the morally disgusting, the socially reviled, the inexcusable and undeserving who do not simply receive Christ's mercy, but to whom Christ most naturally gravitates. In other words, Jesus naturally goes to people who are lost, people who are, we would run away from, people we would say, not them. Jesus goes to those people. He is, by his enemies' testimony, the friend of sinners. This is Jesus being who Jesus is. He is someone who is filled with compassion and his love goes out to them. He cares for them. And that means that if you're sitting here and thinking, well, maybe I could follow Jesus, but come on, would he really have me? If he knew all there is to know about me, if he knew all those failings of mine, all those past sins, all those mistakes I've made, or the fact that I, I keep doing my own thing and going my own way, or I keep trying to improve myself and I keep failing, then you're exactly the person whom he came for. We, we just sang in that children's song, Jesus said, if I am lost, he will come to me. Not even I will come, I can go to him. He will come to me. Because that's who he is. He comes to us as people who are lost. And if anything, the problem is that if we think we're okay, if we think, well, I'm not lost. I mean, why would I? I must be this group of people. I know very firmly where I'm going. If we think like that, then it probably actually shows just how lost we are. Because we're trying to make our own way and... As Jesus says elsewhere, it's from the heart, from within, that our bad thoughts, our evil comes, and we are just going to follow in the wrong direction. However much we might think we're doing the right thing. So Jesus feels compassion for you in your lostness, and he has come for you. Are you willing to go to him? And he also feels compassion for the lost people around you. And will you go to them? Now, notice how this sentence, next sentence begins. So he began. Now, if you've got a Bible in front of you, can you just tell me how that sentence ends? Now, if I was to give this as like an exam question, let's say it's a multiple choice. How will this sentence end? So he began to heal them. He began to listen to them, to be kind to them. Or three, so he began to teach them. How does the sentence end in your Bible? Someone tell me. So how's that? He began to teach them. Lovely, thank you very much. He began teaching them many things. I wonder if that was the, what you would naturally think would follow in that sentence. So Jesus had real compassion on these people, so he gives them a two or three hour lecture. Or, well, we don't really know how long, but it's clearly was going on a long time from what happened. Jesus sees that what people need to hear is the truth about who they are and who he is. And the way this is talked about elsewhere in this gospel is that he teaches them about the kingdom of God, which is just a way of saying how God is coming to act through Jesus to make this world a better place, to transform people from the inside out and to establish God as ruler over all they serve. And that comes through Jesus, through his teaching. And it's important for us to remember this because it shows that people need to be taught that Jesus has compassion for them that Jesus came to offer himself for them, to die on a cross for them, that he came as God's son 
for them. So, this part of the passage teaches us that he, Jesus is the teacher who has compassion. He teaches out of compassion, and he teaches because he's motivated by that. That's him at his deepest heart. And he has compassion for the needy and the lost, and that includes you. Do not think that you cannot come to Jesus. If anything is keeping you from coming to Jesus, it is you, not him. His arms are wide open to receive you. So Jesus is the teacher of compassion, but the second part we see, that Jesus is the king who serves. Jesus is the king who serves. Let's continue with our story. Late in the afternoon, so presumably Jesus has been teaching pretty much all the afternoon, his disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. They're literally saying, this is, this is a wilderness. Like, you know, we've gone out miles from anywhere. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the nearby farms and villages and buy something to eat. It's, you know, the disciples have like been sitting listening to Jesus with the crowd all this time, and they're beginning to kind of look at their watches and think, you know, that maybe their bellies are rumbling and they're kind of saying, um, oh, this is a really big crowd. You know, we, don't we need to kind of send them on so that they can get themselves some food and uh, you know, maybe we can get our break after all? Hmm? Wasn't that why we came, Jesus, to kind of get a bit of a rest? And uh, yeah, I, I would have probably been first in the queue amongst them, you know, tapping Jesus on the shoulder saying, come on. Can you not, you know, get to the end? <laughs> you know, so we can get on. You know. And uh, Jesus says, um, no, you feed them. He's saying very clearly, what, what are you asking me to, you know, tell them to go? If you think they're hungry, and they probably are, you feed them. And immediately he says, right, that's what you should be doing. Now, why is he asking the disciples to do this? Now, let's think back again. Remember our sandwich, how that first story went. Jesus had sent those disciples off. Okay? How had he sent them? If someone has got their Bible in front of them, perhaps they could look back to verse, I think it's verse 9. I'll uh, just check on my own Bible. If my battery hasn't run out yet. So could someone just read verse... I beg your pardon, it's verse 8. Thank you. Can someone read verse 8 for me, please? So Jesus is sending them out. What's the instruction he gives them in verse 8? Return to them and take nothing for their journey except a star. No bread, no wine, no money in their belts. Okay, so Jesus says, right, you go off, take a walking stick. I mean, you're going to do a lot of it, so walking stick's a good thing. But he says, don't take any bread, don't take any food, don't take a bag, so that, you know, you're going to go like stocking up, you know, in your backpack or whatever it is. Don't take any money. Now, how did this story begin? It began saying they return from their mission trip. And they don't come to do and say, oh, okay, Jesus, we're back from our mission trip, but we didn't have any food the whole time. No, that doesn't seem to be a problem. It seems that wherever they went, they got fed. People fed there. And now, what's Jesus saying? He's saying, these people, remember how when I sent you out, you were fed. You now feed these people. And then, what's in the disciples say? <laughs> With what? We have to work for months to earn enough money to buy food for all these people. And they're saying, Jesus, we don't have anywhere near enough money to feed this big group. That we will later learn is at least 5,000, probably near to 10 or 12,000 people. Okay? What are they doing? They're forgetting that when they went out, when Jesus told them to, they didn't have any bread, they didn't have any money, but Jesus provided for them. And now, they're looking at a big crowd, and they don't have any bread, and they're saying, we need money. But again, they're forgetting that Jesus had provided for them. 
Would Jesus tell them to feed that if he could not provide for this crowd as well? Anyway, the disciples do what they're told. And then when Jesus asks them, how much bread do we have? They say, we have five loaves of bread and two fish. Okay, five flat breads, two dried out fish. And there's about five to 10,000 people in front of them. You could, I don't know about you, but my, I can imagine one of the disciples handing this to Jesus, kind of rolling his eyes, saying, yeah, okay, there you go. See, see how far this lot goes amongst them. Okay? That is how it must seem. It seems that the disciples are being the sensible ones, and it's Jesus who's kind of in a danger, really, as to why does he think they can feed so many people? But do you see here, what is Jesus teaching his disciples? He's teaching them, he came as a king, but he did not come as a king for whom other people were to serve him. Every other king has servants. Every other king has people who will come and serve him. Jesus came to serve. And he says that precisely later in chapter 10 of Mark, that that even the Son of Man came not to serve, not to, not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life as a ransom for many. What's Jesus saying to the disciples then? If you are my followers, you serve others as well. If I came to serve, you serve as well. That's what it means to follow me. So if we are people who say we are followers of Jesus, how are we serving? Or, again, maybe this is something that's either keeping you back from being a follower or keeping you from being someone who serves others as Jesus does. Maybe like the disciples, you're saying, I don't have the money. Maybe you're saying, I don't have the time. Or, oh, I'm just so tired, I don't have the energy. What Jesus is teaching his disciples here is, whatever you have, give it to me. Whatever you can do, offer it to me and see what I will make of it. Don't tell me you don't have anything to give me. You do. The problem is you not trusting me to provide. And maybe if we're holding back from serving as we could or should, it's because we don't trust that Jesus has enough to provide for us. That's why you don't give. That's why I'm finding an empty money pot, or we're not seeing money coming into our bank balance, for let's say. Because maybe we don't think that Jesus will provide for me if I'm not giving. Or maybe we just think, I just don't have the time. And we're too worried that we won't get everything else we need to be done. Well, Jesus is maybe saying, make that sacrifice and see if I don't provide for you. Because that's how it works. If we, what we give up for Jesus, he will more than repay. He will provide for us. But our last part here is that Jesus is the shepherd who satisfies. Remember how when Jesus saw them, he saw they were sheep without a shepherd. And now we see here Jesus being presented as someone like a shepherd to them. Let's read this. Jesus told the disciples to have the people sit down in groups on the green grass. So they sat down in groups of 50 or 100. First of all, do you notice just that little detail on the green grass? Just earlier we sang a song that was based on Psalm 23. And what does that psalm say? Say, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures or green grass. Mark is making us think. Here's these people and they're like sheep. They're even on the green grass. But isn't there a shepherd here for them? Now, why have I highlighted the word sit down? Well, 
The word that's actually used is the word to recline. Now, when you recline, you're kind of lying back. Now, you kind of think, okay, so that would kind of lying back on the green grass. What, what's the purpose with that? In those ancient times, when you had a feast, when you had like a really big meal you'd invite people to that you were celebrating, you would recline, you would eat reclining. You would lie down on some kind of bed or sofa type thing and with your feet stretched out and you would like help yourself from the table and you would kind of be fairly relaxed as you were doing it. So it's this was a way in which they would eat their banquet. I can't think of a few people that wish they could eat every meal like that. But the point is that this is being presented as if this is a banquet, this is a feast here. Even the fact that they're in groups of 50 or 100, it's like a little dining room parties here which are being formed and people lying around together as if they're eating a feast together. And that's the way Mark is presenting it, as if it's a big dinner party. Anyway, let's not forget, we've got five loaves, two fish. Hmm. How far are we going to get with this? Jesus took the five loaves and two fish, looked up toward heaven and blessed them, thanking God for them. Then breaking the loaves into pieces, he kept giving the bread to the disciples so they could distribute it to the people. He also divided the fish for everyone to share. They all ate as much as they wanted. And afterward, the disciples picked up 12 baskets of leftover bread and fish, a total of 5,000 men and their families were fed. So I'd say it's probably quite likely to be well over 10,000 or more people here. What Jesus does, he's taken that bread and taken that fish, and in a way that isn't really explained, somehow that all multiplies so that everybody is fed. And they have enough, they're all satisfied, and they even have 12 baskets of leftovers. There's plenty of food left over. What this should be doing is be making us ask, who is Jesus, that he would do this? What is this meant to be teaching us about Jesus? Well, we've seen that where they are gathered is a lonely place. It is a wilderness, okay? And here, apparently from nowhere, bread has been produced to feed a huge group of people. Now, where else in the Bible do we see people in a wilderness being fed from bread in a miraculous way? Anyone know where we might find that in the Bible? The Israelites, when God gave them manna. Lovely. Thank you, Sarah. When the Israelites were wandering from Egypt to the Promised Land, they went through the wilderness, they complained, they said they had no food. And God provided them with this manna, this miraculously provided bread in the wilderness. So it reminds us, it's like Jesus is another Moses. He's someone who's leading people and feeding them in the wilderness. But how is Jesus here different to the last king we saw, Herod. What did we see there? We saw Herod also at a banquet, at a feast. But it was all about himself <coughs> and pleasing his rich friends and guests. And it ended up with a pretty nasty thing happening to John the Baptist. Unlike Herod, Jesus is the king who serves out of compassion. He feeds his multitude of people, he puts on a feast for them, for people who are hungry, for people who are lost, not for people who are the high officials, who Herod serves. Jesus is the king who serves out of compassion. But not only that, as we see, Jesus is feeding these people as if they are sheep in the wilderness. And we've been reminded of that psalm which talks about the Lord is my shepherd. The Lord is the divine name for God in the Old Testament. This is God himself in the person of Jesus, feeding his people, satisfying them, providing them with all they need. 
And it actually takes us back to another passage, and I'll just read this from Isaiah chapter 25, where Isaiah has a prophecy of what it will be like at the end when God provides everything for his people. I'll just read this to us. In Jerusalem, the Lord of our heaven's armies will spread a wonderful feast for all the people of the world. It will be a delicious banquet with clear, well-aged wine and choice meat. There he will remove the cloud of gloom and the shadow of death that hangs over the earth. He will swallow up death forever. The Sovereign Lord will wipe away all tears. He will remove forever all insults and mockery against his land and people. The Lord has spoken. In that day, the people will proclaim, this is our God. We trusted in him and he saved us. This is the Lord in whom we trusted. Let us rejoice in the salvation he brings. And here, we can't help but read this passage and be reminded of what Isaiah had said. That when God saves his people finally and fully, in what elsewhere is called the day of the Lord, when God winds up history and all will be judged, for those who have followed him, for those who say, yeah, I, I, I'm lost, I need a leader. I will follow Jesus. I will put him first. What there will be, it's like a banquet. The best food you could eat will be served. Death itself will be gone. There will no longer be fear of any death as God will raise to life all those who are followers of him. He will wipe away all tears, all sadnesses. If our need is just for comfort from our sadness and brokenness, that's when that will come He'll remove all insults and mockery. And in that day, God's people will give him praise for that. They will delight in that. So, what's going on here then, as Jesus is feeding these people? It's a picture of what's going to happen at the end, where all God's people are gathered around him, and he feeds them a banquet, and they are satisfied. They do not need to fear death. All their tears, all the insults they have suffered have been removed. Everything has been made up to them because they trusted in him. And as we gather together, and those of us who have gathered to share in the Lord's Supper together, again, that meal is given to us to be like a foretaste of looking forward, like in just a tiny little taste of looking forward to that feast when all God's people will be there. All your greatest needs satisfied. Where are you going to find that? What are you looking to? Are you looking to money? Are you looking to a career? Are you looking to education? What we have challenged here is that it's only in Jesus we restore our relationship with God. We're flooded with his love. We feast together with every believer from all history. And will be in the presence of our Father and the Lord Jesus. Every hurt then will be healed. So we see that Jesus shows himself to be the true King and the true God who will satisfy us in the new creation. You can trust him with your life now. And if there are things that you just say, oh, I can't ever forget this hurt. I can't ever get rid of this this sadness within me. But trust Jesus that one day that will happen, even if you can't see it or really feel it now. You entrust that to him. He alone can save us and satisfy our greatest needs. So just to conclude, what can we see? What's this story taught us? Who is Jesus? Jesus is the compassionate shepherd and the compassionate teacher, as we said earlier. He's the one who looks on you in your lostness and he feels deep compassion. Come to him and stop trying to wander your own way and keep getting lost. Jesus is the true king. He's the one who's come to serve. 
He invites you, come, serve others with me. He is the true God who has compassion on his people and feeds and satisfies them. And one day he will provide for us in the greatest feast of all in the new creation. Until then, he can meet your deepest needs now. So the question is, will we go to Jesus to receive all that he offers us? Acceptance, love, forgiveness. Will we go to him to receive that? Or are we going to continue wandering like sheep without a shepherd? Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we do thank you that in the Lord Jesus we have one who has deep compassion for us and who intends to satisfy our deepest needs. Father, help us to see how every other way that we can be looking to satisfy those things is not going to work. We're just going to make ourselves worse and more disappointed. Father, help us to see that Jesus came precisely for us, for needy people like us. Help us to turn to him. And help us, Father, if we are already following Jesus, to see those needy people around us, to share Jesus' compassion for them, and to see how we can be serving him. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.